Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us here tonight. Over the next two hours, we are going to hear about the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee's initiative to integrate social and economic objectives within a modernized Columbia River Treaty. This session is being recorded and will be available afterwards for you to watch or to share. It will be emailed to you all after the session, uh, likely tomorrow or, or shortly after. My name is Brooke McMurchie and I am part of the province of British Columbia's Columbia River Treaty team and I'm pleased to be your host for this event. I'm joining you tonight from the territories of the Lagwankan speaking peoples, known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations also known as Victoria, British Columbia. I also acknowledge with deep respect the territories of the Tanaha, the Shwetmek, the Silks, and the Sinaiaks peoples and neighboring tribes whose territories span the Columbia River Basin. It's great to see so many of you online. There's just over 60 people who are listening in right now. If you'd like to, feel free to put your name in the chat and let us know where you're joining from. Before we dive into the evening, I'd like to take a moment and share how things will flow. In just a few moments, I'll be welcoming Linda Worley, who is the chair of the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee, and she'll start us off with a few opening words. We'll then hear an overview of the Columbia River Treaty and the socioeconomic integration initiative. And part of that overview will include a high level summary of Kootenai River hydro operations. We'll then dive into presentations on the interests and performance measures associated with the Kukanusa Reservoir, the Duncan Reservoir, and Kootenai Lake. We'll take a quick break in between the Kukanusa and Duncan presentations. There will be time for questions after each presentation. And then again, at the end of the session, uh, just before we adjourn around eight o'clock Pacific time or the two hour mark. So many of you have been part of these types of sessions before, but just as a reminder to ask your questions during the session, please enter them into the Q and A function in your Zoom window. Please don't type your questions into the chat as they will be missed. So if you'd like your question or your comment to be seen by the panelists, please enter it into the Q&A box. If you'd like to ask your question verbally, you can use the raise hand function, which is also in your Zoom window. If you are phoning in, you can press star nine to raise your hand. And in both cases, when it's your turn to speak and ask your question, you'll receive a prompt to unmute yourself. If you're on the computer, you'll see a little window pop up. And if you're on your phone, you'll hear a prompt to unmute yourself by pressing star six. You can then ask your question after which, uh, after which we will mute you again, uh, in, unless you have another question. A reminder to please be respectful of those you're asking questions of, and in the interest of time, try not to raise questions that have been already asked. Uh, and please try and limit your questions to about one minute if you're asking them for bully. Finally, please try and keep your questions related to the material at hand tonight. Uh, sometimes it can be difficult and our presenters are here to answer as many questions as possible this evening. Uh, We've got loads of resources to point you in the direction if we're not able to answer what we hear tonight. Uh, in addition, any questions that aren't answered this evening will be included in the summary report, which will come out after the fact. Many of you may be aware that Canada and the United States met last week for another round of negotiations on the Columbia River Treaty. If you're curious to know how that went or to read an update from the minister responsible for the Columbia River Treaty, we encourage you to go to the province of BC Columbia River Treaty website for that. This evening's session is focused on a very specific aspect of work that is informing Canadian discussions around a modernized treaty. Uh, and it's not going to cover updates on, on international negotiations. Uh, so if you are curious to learn more about that, please visit the province of BC's Columbia River Treaty website. 
I think that's it from me. So now I'd like to welcome Linda Worley, who's the chair of the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee to start us off with a few opening words. Welcome, Linda. Thank you, Brooke, and good evening. And thank you everyone for attending this webinar this evening on the Kootenai system of the Columbia Basin. Um, and I'd like to recognize and respect that the lands on which I live and meet are within the unceded territories of the Columbia Basin Indigenous Nations peoples. This Columbia River Treaty Local Government Committee has been working together since 2011 to ensure the voices of the basin residents and local governments are heard in the decisions about the future of the Columbia River Treaty. We have attended numerous rounds of meetings across the basin over the past years, listening to the voices of the local residents in numerous rounds of meetings across the basin to ensure that these voices are reflected through our recommendations. The recommendations have, which we've uh, come up with through these voices of the, of the people of the basin have gone forward to, for consideration to the negotiations team uh, for possibly being um, implemented some of those wishes into the new modernized treaty. The work you'll see presented here tonight is a product of our ongoing efforts to keep this living document of our recommendations as informed and up to date as possible. I'd like to thank the members past and present of the committee for the years of work they've dedicated toward the future health of the basin that has led us to this important scope of work. We're grateful to the province for their support of the committee, including this work, and to CBT for their ongoing support of our work for the health of the Columbia Basin on behalf of the people of the basin. We appreciate your finding the time to attend this evening and listen to the presenters and learn about the immense scope of work presented here today that's being done on behalf of the inhabitants of the basin and the Columbia system, the Kootenai system and all living entities within it. Thank you to the socioeconomic team, integration team who's worked diligently to bring this information to you today. We look forward to your input on this draft work. Thank you. Thanks very much, Linda. I'd now like to welcome Cindy Pierce, who's the Executive Director of the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee and Project Lead for the Socioeconomic Integration Initiative. Cindy is going to be joined by Ryan McDonald with McDonald Hydrology Consultants Limited, and they will provide an overview to provide some context for this evening. Cindy and Ryan. We'll wait just a moment for them to connect. I'm here, but it looks like Cindy might have dropped off. Or where is she? Oh, there I'll she send, is. Yeah, I'll send her. I'll send her a message and see how things are. Oh, she can't unmute. <laughs> Or get my video going. <laughs> of course. Well, we can hear you, Cindy. The co-host has solved the problems. Way to go. I think it's Morgan. Magic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke, uh, for the, uh, the introduction. And Morgan, thank you very much for your work in the background to make sure all the technology works as it should. Um, and also thank you to the province um, for the support for this work directly and a, a great appreciation to be working together with the provincial BC team on this. Um, I wanna thank all the participants, especially those of you who are doing it the second time around. It's nice to see familiar faces. And for those of you for whom this is their second webinar, um, we appreciate your dedication. It's really incredible. Um, the, the, um, the, this session is focused on a particular topic and we know um, that there are other topics of interest around the Columbia River Treaty. The treaty is a complex and far-reaching agreement with confidential negotiations going on. And this session focuses on, on just one specific aspect of this complexity, which is integrating socioeconomic objectives into a modernized treaty. The team working on the socioeconomic integration and who are here tonight for the webinar um, will not be able to answer all uh, questions that are beyond our work and our knowledge of, of the process. 
And so, but we, on, we know that there are a number of other topics that may be on participants' minds. And we wanted to provide you some, with some links uh, for information and where to send questions right up front. So you know you've got that information. Um, and so if I could ask Lauren to share the slide deck and bring up the first slide, that would be great. Thank you. Um, and while I go through these, uh, Morgan will kindly put them in the chat for those of you who want to get them out of the chat as we go forward. Um, and, and the links will be included in the email comes, that comes to you with the recording after the webinar. So the first topic, of course, is the negotiations. And as Brooke has mentioned, um, updates are on the BCCRT webpage. And questions can be sent um, through the CRT email. And both of those links are on this site. We really encourage you to subscribe to the CRT newsletter and to subscribe for updates. This is the source of information on the negotiations. And um, it's really uh, wise if you're interested in this topic to, to, get, uh, to get signed up. The second topic is um, integrating ecosystem function into the treaty. And this is an interest for many people. Uh, the three indigenous nations um, in the BC Columbia Basin involved in the negotiations are leading the process to integrate ecosystem function into the treaty. And the province held an info session with this group um, on this work last June. And a link to the materials and the recording are, are, are shown on the slide here. And again, I would encourage you if you have time, there's some short info sheets, the recording is there and, um, and some background documents as well. The other topic that, there, that is of high interest is salmon restoration. And again, the Indigenous nations in the BC Columbia Basin are also leading an initiative. And this one is called the Columbia River Salmon Reintroduction Initiative or cursory. And you can learn more about that initiative at the, at the link that's on the slide as well. Now, while this session is focused on the Kootenai, I suspect that there are some folks online who are from the Arrow Reservoir um, or the Lower Columbia, where water levels, uh, reservoir and water levels are, are very low historically. And um, we wanted to let you know that information about um, reservoir and flow levels um, come from uh, BC Hydro. And we've provided you the email and the phone number for um, uh, BC Hydro for this information on the slide. Now, we encourage you, BC Hydro provides weekly updates on reservoir levels and notices about changes in flow in the Lower Columbia. And we want to encourage you to sign up for the, their, their weekly and as needed updates. And you can do that through that email address. Now, uh, with regards to this low water topic, the Local Governments Committee ident identified this as a concern <clears throat> that was heard from basin residents, as Linda described, uh, in uh, the 2021 recommendations to the governments that are involved in the negotiations. And we are updating our information around the impacts from the current event, and we'll continue to encourage the Canadian negotiating team to seek solutions to address this concern. So those are some topics that we know are on your mind and um, um, aren't uh, topics specifically related to the integration of uh, socioeconomic objectives, but we wanted to upfront provide you with this information. Um, so Lauren, um, um, if you could uh, click the next slide, please. So I wanted to introduce the other two members of our team. Lauren Ruthore is with uh, Selkirk Innovates and she's our lead, our researcher, and she's uh, responsible doing the PowerPoint clicking for us. And Avery DeBoer Smith is our engagement coordinator. And she, as um, uh, Brooke explained, is, is watching the, the uh, Q&A box and um, will be um, providing questions uh, uh, to be answered through the session. Now, you may have noticed that I'm, I'm, I'm one-handed talking here. My other hand is in a sling. And so I'm a bit of a disabled uh, one darn paper hanger here with a whole bunch of paper around me. So there may be times where you need to just give me a minute, a second or two um, to have my one little hand do what it needs to do. So I appreciate that as we go forward. Thank you. Let's go, let's now dig in on this topic of um, the socioeconomic integration into the Columbia River Treaty. The first section, as Brooke explained, is the background section. So some of you are new to the Columbia River Treaty, so we just wanted to do a few slides of background on the treaty, make sure everybody's got just a basic grounding in it. So 
the treaty, the Columbia River Treaty is a Canada-US tra transboundary water management agreement that was ratified in 1964. Its objectives are, are power generation and flood, and flood management. It required Canada to build three dams, Duncan, uh, which we'll talk about today, Hugh Keenly side or the Arrow, uh, um, um, the, the dam at the end of the Arrow Reservoir and Mica Dam, which creates Kimbasket Reservoir. And, and the treaty allowed the US to build the Libby Dam in Montana, which creates the Kukanusa Reservoir that floods into Canada and also impacts downstream flows. The implementation of these dams inundated um, 110,000 hectares of ecosystems, displaced over 2,300 people in approximately 30 small communities and impacted economic activities uh, for those communities uh, and regions that, were, that were, um, were inundated. Now, the treaty does provide benefits to British Columbia through, first of all, a one-time prepayment for 60 years of assured flood risk management and 30 years of half of the incremental U.S. downstream power potential. And that is called the Canadian entitlement. Since 1995, when that 30 years ran out, um, the Canadian entitlement has been delivered annually um, uh, to British Columbia through electricity um, that the province then decides what to do with in terms of using it in, domestically or selling it. Um, so uh, there, are, um, there are benefits and ongoing benefits from the current treaty. Next slide, please. The status of the treaty at the moment is that flood risk management shifts in 2024, next year, to a more ad hoc or called upon approach. So in 2014, CRT reviews were initiated in British Columbia and the Pacific Northwest, and those reviews recommended modernize, modernizing the treaty, not terminating it. And we provided you a link to the BC decision uh, around, uh, uh, around the review and this decision to modernize the treaty. Canada-US negotiations began in 2018. Canada leads the Canadian negotiating team because this is an international treaty. Um, the team has full participation of BC and the, the regional indigenous nations, the, the Tanaha, the Silk Sokanagan, and the Shikwemek nations. You can, as we've said, see updates on the website. And I wanna say again, sign up for that newsletter, it's precious. Next slide, please. So, in the context of these negotiations, why are we doing this work? What is the purpose of this work? There is a group called the, the CRT Negotiations Advisory Team, and it includes representatives from the five governments that we just discussed. And that team needs to understand how US proposals for treaty changes will impact basin interests and how the treaty can be modernized to increase flexibility for Canadian operations to, to improve conditions for BC basin interests. Those are, are two of the many things that the, 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 uh, the, the NAT needs to understand. And that's the focus of this work. So the, that's the background on the treaty. The next piece is what is the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee? And, and Linda has provided you a background. I'll just skim through some of the more details here. The treaty was formed in 2011 to ensure the voices of Columbia Basin local governments and residents are heard in decisions related to the future of the treaty. It includes 10, uh, currently 10 elected officials. Two are appointed by each of the, uh, the four regional districts uh, in the basin area. And one is appointed by the village of Valemont and another from the Association of Kootenai Boundary Local Governments, which is the collective organization for local governments within the Columbia Basin. basin. As Linda mentioned, the committee provided recommendations to the governments involved in the negotiations in 2014 and in 2021. And the committee has ongoing contact with the negotiating team, with the BC CRT team, and with the CRT, uh, CRT Indigenous Nations representatives. The, the uh, committee also liaises with the BC CRT team to resolve local concerns. Now, some of the issues that we face in the basin are, 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 are due to the international treaty. Some of them are domestic that we can solve locally. And so the, the uh, committee works with the BC team to try and solve those, those domestic issues. The group also leads the, um, the, the uh, CRT socioeconomic integration work. And I want to echo uh, Linda's words around appreciation to Columbia Basin Trust and to the province uh, for their support uh, for the committee. Now we've provided the, the uh, local governments committee website and the member uh, list links 
so that um, you can um, go and look for more information if, if, you're, if you're interested. All right, next slide, please. Now, so, so now, given that we're focused on basin interests, what are those interests? So these are interests that are impacted by river flow levels or reservoir elevations that are, imp that are impacted by the Columbia River Treaty. And uh, click, please. There are the Indigenous nations are leading the work around two types of basin interests. Um, one, of course, is Indigenous cultural values. The second category, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, socio uh, the, uh, the ecosystem function um, um, uh, interests that the Indigenous nations are leading together. The uh, Local Governments Committee leads the socioeconomic interests, and these include things like flooding, navigation, recreation and tourism, health, agriculture, and erosion. And the other uh, uh, interest is power, and the power generation uh, work is led by BC Hydro, understandably. Now, um, I'd like to turn it over to, oh, we're focused on the socioeconomic. We're fo I'd like to turn it over to Ryan, our, our modeling advisor, uh, the wizard, as I like to call him some days, uh, most days. Um, and um, he'll take you through a few slides to explain the process that we're using um, to integrate the socioeconomic interests into the treaty. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Cindy. Yeah, so Cindy talked about, um, you know, having these basin interests, and we need to be able to have a way to bring those interests uh, forward in terms of how do we actually inform negotiations. So um, a lot of the work that we're doing right now is really focused on uh, the modeling component of, of the project. So we're using models uh, to inform uh, the negotiations, and what we're using is, is, is river management models. So these river management models ultimately enable us to evaluate a range of different operations in the system that could help us in uh, meeting the objectives of, of meeting those basin interests. Mm -hmm. uh, put one more slide there. Yeah, so the river management models enable us to look at these range of interests and enable us to um, quantify the effect of operations on performance measures. And we're gonna talk a lot today about performance measures later on. Um, and really what they are is a way to evaluate uh, the different um, things that matter to the basin. So these river management models ultimately, as I mentioned, are used to pull levers in the system and evaluate what the effect of different operations might be. So um, if you click one more forward, we then take um, the, the changes in operations and we can evaluate how those operations affect those performance measures that, that we're looking at. So um, Lauren will walk through this later on in the slides, but ultimately you can imagine um, by changing re uh, reservoir levels or flows out of a reservoir, um, you can change ultimately how a, a given performance measure may um, perform. Um, and I'm gonna talk really briefly about what performance measures are and um, we can sort of walk through sort of how we're using them in this work. Uh, next slide. So what is a performance measure? A performance measure is ultimately a combination of, of four things. So it has to be something that we care about. So there has to be a why. We have to give it a location. So there's a where. So where in the basin do we actually care about that thing? When do we care about those things? And then what actually is it? So if you step through one more slide or one more click, Lord. So as an example, we could look at Kootenai Lake. Um, and Kootenai Lake flooding might be one of the things that we're actually trying to look at. So why would we look at Kootenai Lake flooding? We may want to uh, minimize the damage to property and infrastructure. So that could be one of the, uh, the measures that we're trying to, to look at. Again, where in this case is, is Kootenai Lake. When, uh, this doesn't happen um, <clears throat> just episodically, this would be a year round type of a performance measure. And we would care about the levels in the system um, throughout that, that year long period. Uh, and the levels uh, are the things that we actually define. So the what piece is, the expected annual damage in terms of dollars. Uh, and um, ultimately that's measured when water levels in Kootenai Lake are above 1,752 feet. And the way that we evaluate that is we would say, you know, more times the, 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 yeah, a higher number of, of reaching that 1,752 is worse for the system and a lower number would be better. So that's essentially how uh, we frame performance measures in this work. Our next slide, Lauren. So for this work, we actually have two types of performance measures. We have what we call combined PMs or combined performance measures. And these are essentially for uh, high level initial uh, scenario evaluation. 
Um, we do look at a number of scenarios and as Cindy walked through already, there are a number of different um, components of this work. So there's cultural values, ecosystems, uh, flood control, hydropower. Uh, so we have high level scenario, high level PMs that allow us to evaluate uh, scenarios at a pretty high level. Uh, underneath that is what we call submeasures. So these are things that we use to dig into detail around individual scenarios. So once we have a scenario that we think is working uh, reasonably well, we then use those submeasures to say, okay, um, yeah, we actually understand what's going on and we can look at more specific interests. So an example of this again is that Kootenai Lake flooding. So the combined uh, performance measure is what I already described. That's the expected annual damage uh, when water levels are above 1,752 feet. The submeasures of this uh, would be different components of that. So we could look at different elevation bands. Uh, or if we go forward, uh, one more. Oh, yeah, different elevation bands. We can look at the number of days at or above different elevation bands, and we can look at the number of years at or above those elevation bands. So we're able to sort of uh, dissect the performance measure and really figure out what exactly is going on. Uh, over to you, Cindy. I'm sorry, my voice is bad. <laughs> Hang in there. Hang in there. Uh, thank you, Ryan, very, very much. So the process and timeline that we've used for this work to date is we started back in uh, 2020 to collect information around community interests and previous uh, socioeconomic performance measure, measure information from a number of sources. We also uh, looked at designing the engagement. Um, we, we, it was, it's essential that we hear from you and others around these performance measures. And so we, um, we spoke with a group called the Columbia Basin Regional Advisory Committee. You know, this is, I put a link on this group because they are an important part of the process. This group uh, advises uh, on the uh, CRT and on regional hydro operations. There's about 25 public members who are uh, chosen from expressions of interest from community members, and uh, they're chosen to represent the, 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 the diversity of the geography and interests uh, in the basin. It also, this group also includes Indigenous nations and local government appointees and hydro operator representatives, and um, you can learn more at that link. So we, we, we spoke with that group, we spoke with local governments, Indigenous nations, um, and um, we were designing methods for uh, the public at large as well. That, um, then we moved into, to, uh, no, we don't need to click, whoop, whoop, that's okay, that's okay. Um, then we moved into developing the performance measures. Once we had the information together and we knew we had a plan for how we were gonna do this, then we worked on developing uh, the performance measures, revising the previously used, uh, used performance measures based on new information and developing new performance measures where needed. Some of that work is completed and some of it's in progress as you'll see tonight. Uh, since October, we have been uh, getting feedback from CBRAC, from local governments and from you to, uh, uh, on Monday night and, and uh, today through this webinar. And um, well, that feedback will inform uh, the recommendations that the local government makes on socioeconomic performance measures. And, and we have been moving some of the performance measures into the river management model that uh, Ryan uh, mentioned to test them, because that's really where you learn whether or not they're going to work um, or not, and whether we need to tidy them up. And um, once we get your feedback and it's considered, then they will be finalized. Um, since December, the model has been, uh, been being worked with. And so that there's been some ongoing confidential uh, scenario modeling. And that again, helps us sort of uh, quality, uh, do quality, insure, uh, quality assurance uh, with the performance measures, see if they're making sense with different scenarios has been very helpful. Where we are now then is in the last, and Lauren, you can click again now, please. Where we are now is in the last steps of the process um, um, in finalizing our, our community feedback and then uh, moving through the last steps. Thanks, next slide, please. So here's a pricey of the, of the uh, performance measures. And this is for the Columbia side. Um, I'll quickly run through them. For Kimbasket Reservoir, there's a navigation and recreation and tourism performance measure, and we're working on erosion. Um, for Lake R Revelstoke, there are no performance measures because we have not heard there are community interests that are impacted by, by reservoir level changes. Uh, it doesn't have the same scale of changes that the rest of the system does. For the Arrow Reservoir, uh, there are four performance measures, 
and um, also the erosion one is being worked on. And for the Lower Columbia, um, we, we had uh, flooding and recreation tourism performance measures. And at the session on Monday, we were asked to add a navigation performance measure, which is a new interest. On the Kootenai side, which we're focused on, um, we have the Kukanusa Reservoir. Now, um, for some of you, um, the name of this water body is, uh, is, is Lake Kukanusa. Um, uh, we have currently a recreation and uh, agriculture performance measure. And um, just a week ago, we were asked to consider adding an erosion performance measure as well. Uh, Duncan, we have flooding, recreation, tourism, and health, which um, is related to uh, mosquitoes. Kuni Lake, flooding, navigation, as you'd expect with the ferries, recreation and tourism. And then for Coraline to the confluence, which is the, the part of the river where there's a number of, of dams between the west arm of Kootenay Lake and the confluence with the Columbia, we don't currently have performance measures. Um, there was uh, a question about um, the uh, brilliant pond fluctuations and, and those are not directly impacted by CRT flows. And so um, they're not included. And there was also a flooding concern around a campsite or a, a RV uh, park uh, near the confluence with the Columbia. And because that's affected by backwatering, um, we have included that in the Columbia, Lower Columbia uh, flooding performance measure. Next click, please, Lauren. So a summary of the process then is we've, we are taking uh, input from the Columbia Basin Regional Advisory Committee, local governments and the public. Next click, please. <clears throat> and that's coming to us as a project team and our responsibility is to complete the background work, research to make sure to make recommendations on performance measure and to host these engagement activities. Next click, please. And that information, the recommendations from the team will go to the local governments committee and that committee will make recommendations on the performance measures and, and scenarios for basin socioeconomic interests, which, last click please, will inform, whoops, the, the negotiations advisory team um, uh, in, in, in terms of using the modeling scenarios to support the negotiations. So that's what this process is all about. I think now we'll turn to questions. I'll catch up in my paper moving, my one-handed paper moving. Ah, sorry, one big important thing in red text that the revisions are ongoing in this process based on new information. And so this is not a one and done uh, process. Um, this is a continuous improvement process. So um, don't feel like you have to, you know, we have to get, we, we don't have to get everything right this pass. We can um, um, be uh, put on notice about something, try and, um, um, uh, reconcile it through this process, and, and if we can't, we can keep working on it um, over time. Okay, I think if we can turn to the questions. That's great. Thanks very much, Cindy and Ryan and Lauren for formatting the PowerPoint. Uh, Avery, you've been monitoring the Q&As. What do we have for Cindy? Thanks, Brooke. So the first question for Cindy is, what are the implications for Kootenai River residents? if water is diverted from the Kootenai into the Columbia River in the headwaters of these rivers near Inverness? This question I'm sure relates to the, to the reality that the current treaty includes a provision, um, as I understand it, the current treaty includes a provision that would uh, allow Canada to divert water from the Kootenai into the Columbia. And this is a provision that's been there since 1964. To my knowledge, I have not heard of any interest in, in doing that, but that uh, does exist in the treaty and it does come up at most of these sessions. Thank you. The next question is, has groundwork been done to estimate the costs of building a weir across Kukanusa Lake on the Canadian side? This is a question we thoroughly anticipated. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from um, some notes that I took from um, publicly available information. In, in 2021, the province released a draft feasibility study responding to a pro proposal from some local residents to build a weir dam on Kukanusa Reservoir right at the border so we could control the water levels. Public engagement was conducted and the province provided a summary report. And um, the, the link to the report and the feasibility study are on the, the website and Morgan will put them in the chat. Now in, their, in the province's report, 
The province explained that after reviewing the feasibility study, which did include a cost estimate, so you, so you could go to that link and, and find the cost estimate. Um, uh, where, where are we at here? And reviewing the feasibility study and all the feedback on the issue, uh, the province determined that the first priority to most efficiently address concerns about Kukunus Reservoir water levels is to advocate for increased coordination of Libby Dam operations during the Canada-US negotiations on the CRT. And I've noticed that the minister's statements and her year-end reflections on the negotiations have mentioned that there are discussions happening around increasing collaboration around Libby Dam operations. So this does appear to be underway within the negotiations. Now I've taken some time to answer that question because I know that it is uh, on the mind of folks um, on the in the East Kootenays. Um, but the you know through the work we're doing um, on identifying socioeconomic objectives and performance measures, we really want to know what the interests are related to the treaty matter most to you and what water levels and river flows you think would support those interests. I hope that's that's a helpful answer. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, another question is, why is flooding not included as a performance measure for Lake Kukanusa? Um, why don't we wait until we get to the Lake Kukanusa section and we'll, we'll dig in on that one. Um, and um, uh, I, I, I'll, be, I'll be prepared to answer that uh, then. I think that would be helpful. I, I did notice that there's a couple of questions in the, in the uh, Q and A's about sort of operational issues around environmental monitoring and um, um, log movement and things like that. Those, those are, uh, we're focused on a planning process here and those are not questions that I can, I can really tackle. But we will, as Brooke said, record them in the summary report and um, th there, there may be answers at that point. Thanks, Cindy. We do have time for a couple more questions before moving on, if there are any. Thank you. So uh, someone wanted to add on to a previously asked question about diverting water from the Cooney River into the Columbia and are wondering if there are positions on the Canadian side about keeping or removing this language from the treaty. Now, this is clearly not a question that I'm in a position to answer. I am nowhere near the negotiations at this level of detail. This is a question I'd encourage you to ask the province and they, they may or may not answer because the negotiations are confidential and must be at this point. Thank you. Anything else? Um, I think for relevant questions for the current topic, I think that's it for right now. Thanks. Super. Looking forward to the flooding one coming back. Great. So next up, um, Cindy and Lauren, you guys will, or actually Cindy, you'll continue on with a high level summary of the Kootenai River operations. Is that right? Yes. And before we do that, I want to reiterate the purpose of this, uh, you know, this webinar and this step in the process. Um, we, we are really wanting to introduce the performance measures to you to answer any questions and maybe get some feedback from you during this session. Um, we also really importantly invite you to provide feedback through the online um, survey form and, and Avery will provide the link to that uh, survey at the end of the webinar. Um, what you tell us during the webinar, we will of course keep track of, but we really encourage you to also put your comments into um, the survey. Uh, when you have a, a few minutes. So now let's turn to understanding the Kootenai system just a, a little bit. Um, the Kootenai, the, the Columbia Basin has a series of really winding rivers. And Lauren, if you can uh, trace the river, the Kootenai River for me with your cursor, I would appreciate that. The Kootenai River starts right next door to the headwaters of the Columbia River and it flows south into the top end of Kukanusa Reservoir. Through the reservoir, Lake Kukanusa, down to Libby Dam in the United States in Montana, and then uh, starts coming up north through Bonners Ferry and crosses the border near Creston and into the south end of Kootenai Lake, which is a very, very long lake. Now at the north end of Kootenai Lake is the Duncan River. And the Duncan River flows south through Duncan Dam and into Kootenai Lake. Kootenai Lake has a, a big long arm called the West Arm, which has a Nelson on the end of it. And then the river flows out of the West Arm through a number of, of dams that are not CRT dams 
and then into the Columbia River. So it's a sinuous river system because of all the wonderful, gorgeous mountains we have in the area. That's the, that's the Kootenai system. The, the operation of the Kootenai system is more complex than the Columbia. Next click, please, Lauren. The, the, the reservoir elevations um, and, and are the result of, of inflows less whatever the dam outflows are. So you can think about it as a big bathtub. And I'm going to find an image and use a bathtub in this at one point. So um, the reservoir elevations are based on inflow. Some of them are regulated by upstream dams and some of them are natural. And then there are the, the dam outflows. And the dam outflows for the Kootenai system are defined um, as they are for the Columbia um, by the Columbia River Treaty, which, is, uh, which uh, provides for flood risk storage and power generation by the Duncan Dam, which is uh, 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 a CRT dam and also is, uh, can be uh, managed through the non-treaty storage agreement and the water use plan. Um, and the system is also run, uh, dam outflows are also uh, based on domestic power generation needs. Now that's, that's, those are the three that are relevant also on the Columbia side. On the Kootenai side, there are additional factors. And one of them is that for the Libby Dam operations, they have requirements, legal requirements under, U, under the U.S. Endangered Species Act for particular flows to benefit uh, endangered species, fish species. Now, those flows uh, benefit not only fish species in the U.S., but as I said, uh, the dam flows from, uh, the river flows from Libby Dam into the north end of, uh, the south end of Kootenai Lake. And there's a portion of that flow that is, you know, in, in Canada. So these uh, Endangered Species Act flows do benefit fisheries species in, in British Columbia. And then additionally, uh, for Kootenai Lake, there is an International Joint Commission order. Now, this is a very old order. Uh, it was made in the, in the, in the 19, early 1900s. And it, is, um, it was, uh, was created to uh, provide for power generation in those dams uh, on the, at the end of the West Arm. Um, while not impacting the agricultural interests at the south end of, of Creston, uh, of Kootenai Lake in the Creston area and then in the Bonners Ferry area. So there's another additional management requirement on Kootenai Lake. Um, and we'll come back to that when we get to Kootenai Lake. So the result of the inflows and the outflows creates this diagram of, of, uh, of, of reservoir elevations. And this is an example for Kukanusa. Um, from 1980 to 2020, and the, the, uh, the uh, elevations in meters and feet are on the y-axis up the, up the sides of the graph, and then months are across the bottom, and we start in January. The blue line is the average reservoir level over that period of time, that 40-year period of time. The, the, blue, the blue highlighted area is the most common reservoir levels, the 90th and, and uh, 10th percentile, they call them, uh, uh, during that period of time. And then the gray uh, 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 shading is the kind of outliers, the maximum and minimum levels uh, for the reservoir over that time period. So again, they, the, the operations are based on the inflows, which vary from year to year. Um, minus the outflows. And it results in this kind of a pattern in most of the, of the reservoirs in the basin um, over time. And, and Lauren will come back to this diagram um, um, very soon. So let's now look at Kukunusa Reservoir um, or Lake, Lake, uh, Lake Kukunusa. Um, uh, some quick facts. Next click, please. So this is the transboundary reservoir. Um, it has 67 kilometers in British Columbia and 140 kilometers total. Uh, again, the, the dam is in Libby, Montana. Uh, all of the inflows are natural. There are no regulated inflows. So the reservoir has to deal with whatever comes at it, so to speak. The outflow is managed by Libby Dam, which is, uh, is uh, owned and run by the U.S. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, that dam does have power generation capacity. The storage is 5 million acre feet. And I apologize, we had put million acre feet written out on our other graphs and we'll do that, our other, our last presentation, we'll do that before we send this out to everyone. And a, a million acre feet is basically um, one foot deep 
across a million acres. And that's how um, water management engineers um, uh, think about the storage within the bathtub. The annual water fluctuation is up to 72 feet or 22 meters. So it's a substantial up and down. Next slide, please. The, um, the socioeconomic goals that we are currently aware of uh, for this area are recreation and tourism, maximizing the community benefits from the quality and diversity of recreation and tourism, and grazing, maximizing grazing opportunities within the reservoir draw drawdown zone. Now I hear you that, um, uh, the, I hear the question about flooding, and um, we had not been informed that flooding was uh, an issue um, in this reservoir. Um, um, I want to hear more about that when we get to the question session so we can understand uh, you know, what the exact impacts are from flooding. So thank you. Lauren, I think it's over to you unless there's that graphic. Well, here we are. Um, so to try and put um, these elevations in, into context, and um, I wanted to show you a couple of pictures, and these are thanks uh, uh, to Stuart Rood for providing them to me. This is a picture of the reservoir um, from the causeway sort of in the northern third of the reservoir, the portion in Canada, um, looking north. And this is August 5th, 2020, um, when the reservoir is, is uh, near, near or full pool. Full pool is uh, 2459 feet. Next clip, please. And this is the, the reservoir four months earlier. On April 24th, same year, 2020, when it's at 2404. And this, um, you know, this shows you a, what a 50 foot difference in elevation means uh, within the reservoir at this, at this location. Certainly the northern end of the reservoir gets drained, of all reservoirs gets drained, um, in, in British Columbia gets drained more deeply uh, simply because of elevation changes as you go from north to south yeah, in British Columbia. So just wanted to put uh, that, the graphic in context um, with some pictures. All right. Over to you now, Lauren, please. Okay, so let's dig into um, some of the details of the performance measures. We're gonna show you one of these graphs for each reservoir or river segment. They can help us sort of visualize how the, the recommended performance measures line up against historic water levels, which of course reflect historic hydro system operations. Um, it's important to note that operations might change in the future. So these graphs shouldn't be thought of, of as a limit on what's possible, but they do help us sort of calibrate our thinking in terms of what, of how achievable a performance measure might be. So for Kukanusa, we have two performance measures that we've been working on. The first is uh, recreation and tourism and the range um, we've recommended is represented by this, this dotted box here. So you can see that the average reservoir levels are, are generally within the recommended range, uh, with the exception of the spring. Um, and that's a common trend that we see across recreation and tourism PMs for most reservoirs. Uh, recreationists would generally prefer uh, if water was higher in the spring months. For grazing, you can see our interim performance measure, uh, that it's that solid line with the arrows pointing downwards. And you can see that uh, if historic operations continue as they were, this performance measure would only be achieved in the early spring, um, as ranchers generally prefer that the water levels are, are lower throughout the grazing season. Uh, so let's dig into these details of the performance measures a bit more. Cindy, you're up for grazing. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so there are several grazing licenses within the drawdown zone in the northern portion of the reservoir. These are essentially, uh, they were private properties that were inundated when the reservoir were created, was created, and the uh, ranchers now have uh, licenses to be able to conduct grazing on them um, when the water levels are low enough and the uh, forage is in good enough condition. Now we have had to wait for some mapping, uh, much improved mapping data to be able to understand the elevations in the, in the inundated portion of the reservoir. We've just got that, we've gotten that information recently. And I've been working through with the range officer to make sure that um, uh, we've got the right information to, uh, to move forward on this, um, this performance measure. And so the measure is the, the number of hectares per year 
that are available about, um, and it should be below, and that we've caught it on the other one, Lauren, this one should be below the, the, this elevation so that the, um, the, uh, the area is available for, for grazing. Um, the season is from May 1st to October 31st. That would be ideal, of course, and we're looking forward to working with the ranchers to understand you know, what their highest priority uh, dates are and, um, and what the implications are if they don't have access to that grazing. Now, we know that this performance measure conflicts with the recreation and tourist, tourism performance measure, which wants the reservoir high. And we, you know, our job is not to reconcile all of the performance measures. It is to record the current interests um, in the area um, and uh, uh, look at how those interests are impacted by a variety of, of scenarios. Now, inundation doesn't just affect how much area is available for grazing. It also affects the condition of the range, uh, the, the plants, the forage plants. If they're inundated for a long time, they're in, in less good condition. It takes them longer to um, pop out of it and, and get to a state where they can be grazed. So we, 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 we have, um, have on the docket to look at a grazing condition performance measure as well. So this is interim. It's a work in progress. And we look forward to, uh, to refining it over time. Uh, so for recreation and tourism, the elevation range we've recommended is between 2445 and 2455 feet over the season, June through September. Uh, that's a preferred elevation range that we've heard from multiple organizations that represent recreationists around the reservoir, um, including the regional district of East Kootenai. One note here is that um, in past processes, we have developed uh, past processes that have been developed for performance measures on treaty reservoirs. There's been a specific performance measure about uh, kokanee angling. And so we went back and forth with local biologists uh, and fisheries folks on this and have de determined that the data underpinning that performance measure is, is a bit problematic and also out of date. And uh, in fact, the focus on kokanee as a species might also evolve as there are perhaps some other um, species that are also becoming important to the reservoir. So we've recommended some, some research, a creel uh, survey or angler preference survey to help us develop a more current understanding of angling trends on the reservoir. And this is one of those performance measures where we've developed a series of sub-measures. Uh, and we've done this out of recognition that recreation is not one thing. There are, of course, many different types of recreation and each has its own access needs and preferences. And sometimes those even differ across sites. For example, if we think about boat launches. So um, these sub-measures sub represent the detailed information that we have on activities or sites that we have information on, which is uh, not comprehensive. There are definitely sites and activities uh, that the research team hasn't been able to find data about. Um, an important note with the sub-measures is that we differentiate between access and experience. Access is fundamental because you can't do the activity without access, but experience is also important because um, access is not really valuable if the activity isn't, you know, desirable at the full range of accessible information or accessible elevations. And you can see that difference uh, come out in the sub-measures here. Motorized boating access is possible as low as 2,407 feet, but because of uh, various hazards, hazards that exist at those low water levels, boaters prefer when water levels are much higher, uh, 2,440 or, or even higher. All right, let's go back to questions. Let's, um, this, this flooding question. Every time we've interacted with folks on these performance measures, we've asked, um, are there concerns about flooding? Um, and we haven't been able to identify any specific circumstances where there are concerns about flooding. There are clearly concerns about debris at high water, uh, conditions, and you, you may have noticed that we have a sub-measure in the recreation and tourism performance measure because it's a principally a boating issue as we understand it. So, th so the reason we don't have a flooding performance measure is that we don't have information that would indicate um, um, the, 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 the impacts. Um, so if there are uh, areas, properties, and, and, and with the socioeconomic performance measures, we are not uh, focused on in the environment that's over in the ecosystem function work. If there are, are, are properties or community infrastructure that are impacted by flooding, 
please let us know. Um, um, ideally, um, uh, by uh, uh, filling out the survey. And there's a section there where you can add uh, information for each of the performance measures if you wish. I, I'm, I'm gonna notice I, I, the question again about diverting the Kootenai, I, I've, I think we've dealt with, and I'm, I'm not wanting to go further on that one. Um, the, uh, the, the other question about money for recreation, et cetera, that again is more of an operations piece that would be uh, beyond our planning work that we're doing here. Um, Maybe as you pause there, I'll also let folks know, I mean, this isn't an invite to flood the Q&A box, but uh, you know, your comments and questions that we might not be able to answer in this in this um, forum will be seen by other folks who, who may have an opportunity to answer. So uh, just, just so folks know that these questions are um, not dying on the vine, so to speak, in this session, they will be uh, shared with folks who might be able to answer them. I see, Karen, your comment. Um, um, what we are working on is um, reconciling uh, interests within each of the reservoirs and then across the system over time and through the, the scenario work. I understand the relative merits of, of food security for sure. Um, and it, you know, if 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 uh, if it was it became necessary in the process to reconcile the performance measures uh, around particular interests in a reservoir, uh, we would bring those folks together to have a discussion about this to understand their concerns and try and reach a community level agreement. Um, it's not ours on our own to do that reconciling. Does that help? I hope that helps. Thanks, Cindy. And just a reminder to folks uh, to, you can raise your hand if you'd like to ask your question verbally. Um, I've seen a few hands go up and then go back down again. So feel free if you, if you have a question and you're not too sure about whether to ask it, you go ahead, uh, safe space here. And also just to acknowledge that everyone's receiving probably a lot of really dense information here this evening. And a reminder that all of the details about the performance measures are on the local government committee's website. So if you're, if you want to kind of digest what you've heard and go back and review that material before sending your questions to the LGC email address uh, or filling in the survey that's also on their website where that's how you can provide your feedback on the performance measures that have been identified, uh, go for it. So. Lots of lots of dense information. Uh, questions might not come to mind right away, and and that's just fine. And thank you, Brooke. And I, 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 I we haven't actually described what's on the website. I realize um, there are um, summary documents for each uh, for the Columbia and the Kootenai that basically reflect what's in this presentation, but in text form. Um, and then there, for each of the performance measures, there are information sheets that um, provide more details uh, around what Lauren and I have spoken about, um, sometimes in great detail about how we got to where we got to because it was a long journey, um, sometimes pretty quick. So um, you're, we certainly encourage you to go and have a look. And Morgan, thank you again for putting that. Oh, Avery, thank you for putting that into the chat box. That's wonderful. No more questions? I think we can move on. Oh, we do have one question. Ah. Are the seasons in the performance measures subject to change with respect to climate change? Well, the, I want you to know that the seasons for recreation and tourism in the performance measures across the basin has already have, have been changed from where they were, say, 10, 20 years ago uh, from the processes that have been done in the past. The, you know, the spring has, the, the summer season, the recreation season has gotten longer. So uh, we are reflecting the information as we have it now. And within the scenario evaluation work, climate change is also being integrated. So it is, it is front and center. Thanks, Cindy. Um, there's a couple more questions I haven't had a chance to skim through. Uh, the last one around the dollar value um, of electricity from Libby Dam is way outside my wheelhouse by a long shot. I'm sorry about that, but that's just, that's the way it is. Um, um, the, the question about how much does maximizing these performance measures depend on Canada securing flexibility, which I understand to basically mean reduced commitments for water storage and flood 
flow management in the negotiations with the US. Well, as, as the presentation at the beginning said, um, the, the, the purpose of the work is to inform the negotiations with regards to the flexibility that Canada, the increased flexibility that Canada, that the five governments are seeking through their negotiations um, with, the, with, the, uh, with uh, the United States. Um, and certainly, you know, what comes out of those negotiations will lead to um, uh, reservoir management uh, approaches that will hopefully um, create better conditions relative to the performance measures. That's what, you know, that's what the intention is. There you go. I'm just reading this last question here that was posed. Um, maybe time yeah. for one more before we take a short break. Go ahead, Cindy. I think that last question is more of a comment and, and I, I hear you. For there certain. you go. All right. Um, there's one comment that's just popped up. Cindy directed at you, so yes. maybe have a look and then we can take a break. Hi, Brett. I'm happy. I was so happy to see you sign on. I'm I'm um, I'm regretting that I haven't been able to reach out to you. Um, um, thank you. I'm I'm glad you appreciate it. We're we're working on it. Um, how far apart are the ideal compared to what works for recreation? Is it a big difference, or could there be a compromise? Lauren, could you please pull the PowerPoint back up and go to the reservoir graph slide, please? And and Brett, I appreciate you. Um, asking a question about a compromise um, because that's um, you know those are the, that's the work that we'll need to do over time again this isn't a one and done process we needed to get your performance measure properly defined and you know all we have right now are some initial elevations and so we we put the performance measure at the lowest elevation we need to under, we need to understand where the vegetation is that's most important. And we under, need to understand what time of the year is most important to you. And once we, we get to that stage, and I just was able to talk with the range officer today. I, she's been a very, she's a very busy lady. Um, and once we get to, to that stage, which we will do with you, um, then we can maybe look at how, how do we find something that works for everyone. And I don't know what that'll look like at all, but we need to get the grazing information properly defined first. And I very much look forward to coming back and having that cup of coffee with your family. Wonderful. Well, thanks again, Cindy and Lauren, for kicking <laughs> us off here with, with these discussions about performance measures. Uh, we are gonna take a short break here. Timing. Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll take a short break here for about five minutes and then we'll come back and hear uh, similar, similar information about the Duncan Reservoir and then Kootenai Lake. Uh, but for now, y'all can leave the, the webinar running. Um, we'll put up a pause slide and we'll come back here at 10 minutes past the hour and, and start things up again. Thanks everyone for joining, by the way. I, I've had a chance to look at the participants list. I see a lot of familiar names and a few new ones as well. So it's really great to see See all you folks listening in. We'll talk to you in about five minutes. And, and Hi folks, we are back. So now we are going to, I'm gonna turn it back over to Cindy and Lauren to talk about performance measures for the Duncan Reservoir. Thank you. So we're gonna move now to the little one, the Duncan Reservoir. So the Duncan River, as I mentioned earlier, comes into the north end of Kootenai Lake. And the, the dam is just upstream of, um, of uh, uh, the inflow to the Kootenai River, uh, pardon me, to the Kootenai Lake. And there is a little stretch called the Lower Duncan River between the dam and the lake that um, we're, gonna, we're gonna focus on during this session as well. So quick facts, please. Lauren, this is the baby reservoir. This is the smallest CRT reservoir. It's, it's not tiny at all, but in the magnitude of the other reservoirs under the treaty, it's a small one. It's 45 kilometers long. The inflows are all natural. Um, the outflow is through Duncan Dam, which is owned by BC Hydro. It does not have power generation. Um, lo the lower Duncan, um, uh, the piece I mentioned to you, um, has, <clears throat> it has inflows that are related to the uh, Duncan Dam regulate the, the inflow. Let's start that again. 
The lower Duncan River inflows include regulated flows from Duncan Dam and then the natural inflows, which are quite substantial from the Lardo River and Meadow Creek. The, the uh, storage in this reservoir is uh, 1.4 million acre feet. If you remember um, uh, Libby, uh, uh, sorry, Kukanuso, uh, if I recall correctly, was five. Um, and the annual fluctu but the annual fluctuations are up to 98 feet. And, and this reservoir basically goes from full to empty most years, not all, but most years. Next slide, please. So for the reservoir itself, we have a performance measure for recreation and tourism that is similar to the other ones, um, the one for uh, uh, the Kukanusa Reservoir, and it is to manage, ma man ma maximize the quality and quantity of recreational experience, including reservoir access and visual aesthetics. There's also performance measures for the lower Duncan River, and that includes flooding, uh, minimizing the damage to people and property, and then a mosquito nuisance and health risks. Um, and we don't have a specific goal for that one yet. We are working on that one. And the map shows you um, the portion that is the reservoir, and then there's the dam, and then there's the lower Duncan River, and then there's uh, Kooten Lake. Over to Lauren. Okay, so we have uh, one performance measure for the reservoir, and that's recreation and tourism. And you can see that trend of having a, a tail stick out into the spring um, is reflected here. Recreationists would prefer that water levels are higher during what has traditionally been the, uh, the spring recharge period. This box is actually a little bit uh, misleading because this performance measure takes a weighted approach in that the shoulder seasons um, aren't valued as heavily as the core recreational season. Uh, and let's take a look at that. So we've We've recommended continuing the weighting approach that's been used in past performance measure processes that have um, received community input. The, the core season of July 15th to Labor Day um, is weighted most heavily with the season starting in April 1st and then ending at uh, about Thanksgiving being weighted a little bit lower. The weightings also apply to different reservoir elevations. So I'll just click through here to show you. Um, the, the community prefers that the water level is, uh, you know, between one and 1.5 meters below full pool and levels higher and lower than that, yeah, higher and lower than that are weighted a little bit less. Um, there's one sub measure that we've been able to develop for Duncan and that's focused on debris. So high water introduces a lot of floating woody debris into the reservoir, which can be a hazard while also uh, damaging recreational assets like, like beaches and boat ramps. Um, and then we have one performance measure for the, the Duncan River. So note here that the units on the graph are not uh, elevations, they're flow units. So we've got uh, cubic meters per second and cubic feet per second. Also note that um, this measure is, is measured below the Lardo confluence. And so, and the Lardo River is, is free running. So part of the flow that's tracked in this graph is regulated and, and part is not. There's two components to the uh, flooding performance measure. The box here represents low lying areas and you can see that does occur periodically uh, in the summer. And the line with the arrows is for extensive flooding. And that happens uh, more rarely within the 10th percentile of flows. So I've been um, uh, tracking this performance measure and the, um, the, the, the numbers are, the levels are uh, from uh, the Duncan water use plan. Um, and we basically have two performance measures, one around low lying areas. And these are the days per year um, um, in, in that high flow years should come out of there. We did make that change. Sorry, folks. There's so many details in this stuff that every once in a while they squirm on through. So apologize. We'll catch those in the later um, in the version that comes out to you. So these are days per year. And we uh, the information that we're working with was around um, cubic meters per second. So four to five, 400 to 500 cubic meters per second um, is the is the flow range. Um, and the uh, you know, we're looking for less days per year where we're in that range. And the concern is that seepage is occurring and the risk of flooding 
is high if there's a rain event or a need to increase dam flows for any reason. So that's the reason for this low-lying area flooding performance measure. Next slide, uh, next click, please. The extensive flooding performance measure um, is when um, there's an extensive area of low-lying areas that are flooded, including hay fields. And there is an important um, uh, industrial site in the Lower Duncan that um, gets flooded at this point in time as well. And these are with flows that are above 500 CMS. And we are measuring days per year um, above that level and less is better. Now we do have submeasures for this, um, this one as well. And that these submeasures um, um, would will for a particular flow levels will measure the numbers of days that the flow level is reached and the number of years when it's reached. Because it isn't just the total number of days in the year. Um, it's you know uh, on, on an average in any one uh, over the uh, scenario period, it's actually uh, for these particular flow levels. Uh, how many days and how many years, that's what causes uh, the actual damage. Now, on one more click, please, Lauren. Um, again, I, these, are, these information is based on the water use plan from the early 2020s. Uh, we would really appreciate receiving dated photo, photo verifications. And um, when the flow levels get high uh, next spring, hopefully someone, we can send someone up with a camera and, um, and take pictures. And that's how we verify when um, you know, flooding impacts are a concern. Um, I've, I've provided the uh, email address for the local governments committee there. If um, any locals are online and they want to take pictures of low-lying areas flooding or the industrial site or any uh, impacts, that's really, really helpful for us. Thank you. Over to Lauren. Okay, so we did want to we did want to mention mosquitoes here, as we know this is an important issue for the Duncan River community. We've done a fair amount of research on this one and have concluded that we're we're not able to develop a performance measure at this time. Uh, while we have evidence that there there is a relationship between regulated flows from the dam and mosquito presence in the Meadow Creek area, uh, we don't have enough data to set a specific threshold that we're able to use for a performance measure. The relationship between um, dam discharges and mosquitoes, it's not straightforward, it's, a, it's complex. And we also don't know what level of mosquito presence is problematic for the community in terms of nuisance or health risks. So those are the barriers that we're dealing with at this time. And it would take a little bit more research to, to, to overcome those barriers and that research isn't, isn't currently within for us. Okay. Um, um, the first question, Ed, if I had two hands, I would quickly go to the local government committee recommendations and quote from them. But I, I, the, the committee has uh, a recommendation about flood risk management. Um, and um, uh, we don't have the link um, at hand right now, but maybe uh, Avery will be able to get that and put it into the chat box. Um, it does have a recommendation around flood risk management. Um, in, including, and I, I just don't know the exact, how it's exactly worded, but including um, local governments sort of doing what they can to reduce flood risks. Um, it's probably not as fulsome as an answer as you'd like, but um, it's what I can get to you with the sort of one-handedness at the moment. Um, I see the question about uh, economic potential, and, and we're not, um, uh, we're not uh, focused on um, that kind of thing in this process. So I'm gonna pass on that question. Um, the next question is around Lake w Windermere uh, remaining protected against flooding. Lake Windermere is not one of the CRT, is not a CRT reservoir. It's not a reservoir, it's a lake. And so that's not part of this process either. So I, I'm, I'm not in a position to answer that. Hey Cindy, um, there, there yes. is somebody who has raised their hand. So if we could jump over and uh, allow that person to ask their question verbally, and then we can jump back over to the written questions. Yes, I'm sorry, I forgot that part of the process. I That's was okay, that's why I'm here. Question. Okay, thank you. <laughs> all all good, all good. Uh, so we, we heard from this gentleman on Monday, Buzz Harmsworth, you go ahead and unmute yourself if you're still interested in speaking. And we'll give him just a moment here. All right, never mind. Back to the Q and A's. Go ahead. Okay, uh, all the oh. information. We're, no. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Buzz. That's great. 
all the information we're getting this evening is very interesting, but um, um, we want to know here on Lake Windermere, uh, is it going to be adjusted in any way to do with water supplies to, to the coast from the Kootenai River or from other rivers in question? Uh, I mean, we see our, the original the original article that I received on the the uh, trust from the uh, treaty was that this was all going to be flooded, water raised considerably. So, you know so Buzz, um, the the I think the article that you're referring to was part of the original work that was done by U.S. and Canada around the development of the Columbia, and there were yes. proposals to flood the East Kootenai or the West Kootenai, and there were a number of different dam options. Those, the, the decisions were made through the treaty in nine, and ratified in 1964, and four mm -hmm. treaty dams were created. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not aware of any, any plans anywhere, anytime, to flood the East Kootenai through the Columbia River Treaty. It's just, <laughs> that, that was an old uh, planning process to explore alternatives. Thank you. Yeah, well, it's nice. it's nice for the people of this area to know that we're going to be set safe, normal, normal. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Buzz. Go ahead, Cindy. Um, in the Q and A, the next question is around um, whether the loss of the land was worth what we get from this devastation in, of the Duncan Valley. That's a question that's well beyond the scope of this work. Um, if you're interested in learning more about um, the, the impacts, there's a report by George Penfold that you'll find on the CRT website, um, but that's not something I can comment on. Uh, now, the next one is around the downstream benefits, and that is, uh, is a, you know, that's, a, that's a negotiations kind of topic, and that's not one I can address either. Ah, the the um, the uh, the salmon uh, the Columbia River Salmon Recovery Initiative, which I gave a link to earlier, um, is is uh, looking at uh, salmon restoration um, through uh, the uh, Columbia in Canada, including uh, in the Sulcan and Lemon Creek, where you know where they were historically, um, and so that would be the place to go and um, and and check on, on uh, what's going on around salmon recovery. Thanks, Cindy. We have another person with their hand up. I'm going to allow Ellen to ask their question. Ellen, go ahead. It might take a moment. Hi, everybody. I think I must have hit, uh, raised my hand by accident. <laughs> Well, thanks for That's thinking, okay, Ellen. Ellen. <laughs> I was wondering, oh my gosh, what was my question? I don't have a question, but thanks anyway. <laughs> You're very welcome. Great to hear your voice. <laughs> uh, all right, we, we have another raised hand from uh, two folks that we here at the province know quite well, uh, Mario and Ken. I will unmute the two of you. You can ask your question. Love to hear you, Mario. <laughs> Mario or Ken? All right. Maybe we'll come back. Uh, they might have also inadvertently hit their raise hand, but um, there'll be plenty of chances to ask your question if you have one to ask, Mario and Ken. Um, Cindy, you want to go back to the Q&A box? There's a question about whether similar work is happening on the U.S. side of the border uh, to what has been discussed here. I'm not familiar with any work uh, of this nature, but the negotiations are very confidential, and uh, there may be something that I'm not aware of, um, but I'm not aware of anything. All right. It looks like uh, the folks, Mario and Ken, have themselves unmuted. Would you like to ask your question now? Yes, I would. My Hi, Mario. Hi. My name is Mario Scottler. I followed the Columbia River Treaty from day one. I'm probably older than dirt. However, 
You mentioned social and economic. The ecosystems were destroyed when we signed the Columbia River Treaty. And the economic part of it, I seem to, whether it's me or I don't know, I seem to have missed that Libby Dam 19, uh, in 2017 produced $138 million worth of power. We haven't got one cent of that power from 1945. This committee prepared to make recommendations on that to our bargaining committee because I think it's a big part of the negotiations. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Mario. And I'm going to leave like, that one there. Can I? Can I? I, I I'm, can I respond to that? I'm sorry, but you go ahead, Kathy. Surprise guest. <laughs> Mario, you're my hero, and uh, and Ken, who's helping you, totally be engaged in in your 90s. And we need more people like you, to, and you young people, to uh, make their voices heard. And I'm going to tell you, Mario and Ken, that it's exactly what we're talking about at the negotiating table. So uh, you don't need to trust us, but we will come back to you and tell you how we are going to deal with that. And hopefully you will be satisfied. Thanks Thank so you. much, Kathy. And thanks again, Mario and Ken. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Cindy, we have time for maybe one more question before moving on to Kootenai Lake interests. There aren't any in the box nope. that I can answer. The one that's there is similar to the question was made, we made. Perfect. It was asked. That's wonderful. Okay. Well, why don't we move on then to Kootenai Lake interests? I see a note, Brooke, about um, people don't know who Kathy is. Could you maybe address that, please? Yes, absolutely. So Kathy Eichenberger is the uh, executive director of the province of BC Columbia River Treaty team. And she's also the British Columbia lead on the Canadian negotiating delegation. And she's listening in here tonight because she wants to hear what everybody has to say and the input on, these, uh, on this work uh, to identify performance measures. And she was going to be incognito, so there weren't inadvertently questions raised about negotiations, but I know uh, our team has a great relationship with Mario and with, um, with Mario for years, and so I know it meant a lot to her to respond to Mario's question there. So. Uh, if you do, as a side note, if you do follow our social media or uh, any sort of public communication we have about the negotiations and, and we mention how BC is at the negotiating table, Kathy is our representative there. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that and thank you for the question, Amy. So let's go to Kootenai Lake. So Kootenai Lake, I've described a couple of times, it's a long, long one with uh, uh, Duncan Dam at the north and the Duncan River and Libby Dam regulating flows in, in through the south. Um, click again, please. Brooke, uh, Lauren, it's getting late. I'm losing it. So for Kootenai Lake, um, sometimes it's a lake and sometimes it's a reservoir. It's uh, 104 kilometers long. It's big. The inflows are regulated by Libby Dam about 44% on, through a year, over the year, and by Duncan Dam about 16%. And then there are huge natural inflows from um, both of those dams through the length of the, of, of, of the reservoir and, and the west arm. And that's about 40% of the annual inflows. At some times of the year, especially when uh, there's uh, the freshet, um, the natural inflows are much higher than what the regulated inflows are. So sometimes it's a lake uh, with natural inflows uh, uh, driving uh, lake levels. And sometimes it's a reservoir with the upstream reservoirs um, driving the, the levels. The outflow is Coraline Dam, which is owned by Fortis. And Coraline Dam is regulated under the um, International Joint Commission order, as I mentioned earlier. Now that order must be consistent with the Columbia River Treaty. So the two have to work in, in tandem as best as possible. 
the annual water level fluctuations are only up to 16.5 feet. Um, it's much less than uh, on the um, CRT uh, reservoirs. Next slide, please. And there are lots of interests on Kootenai Lake and so consequently lots of uh, socioeconomic goals. First one is flooding, really critical, um, especially along the West Arm where there's lots of development um, and um, with regards to the ferry operations. And then navigation um, relates directly to the ferry, important ferry operations um, uh, along the lake. Recreation and tourism is, a, is, is very important and the, the uh, goal is very similar to um, the goals on the other reservoirs. And then at the south end of the lake around Creston, there are some goals around um, um, Creston Dyke Management, an important set of infrastructure that's uh, impacted by um, uh, on lake levels. And, and we've learned actually uh, river levels, maybe even more so. And so the intention there is to support farming and wetland protection by minimizing pumping costs at critical times. Next slide, I believe, is over to Lauren. Yeah, so, so here's the graph for Kootenai Lake. Um, and we have four performance measures to show you. So flooding, um, again, there's two components as there are for other reservoirs or river segments. Oh, rivers, okay. Um, the highest one, this dotted line with the arrows uh, is flooding that causes documented structural damage. And you can um, see that this is happening relatively rarely within the top 10th percentile of flows up here. Low lying area flooding, that dashed box, um, that happens more frequently in the spring and early summer. There's two components of a performance measure relating to dikes in the Creston area, as uh, Cindy mentioned, she'll get into those in detail, but you can see that um, because average elevations are, are generally below the upper threshold, this one is, is usually met, but not always. And for the lower threshold, that one is, is usually not met. Um, navigation is this big double box around the whole, basically the whole graph. And you can see um, those, that performance measure relates to, to the lake elevations needed by the ferries to operate. And you can see that that's almost always met except for you know, the very extreme ends of the hydrograph here. And then um, finally, recreation and tourism, which is this big solid box in the middle. You can see that average flows are generally within the range, except for um, a couple of weeks in the middle of the summer when they typically go above the, the seasonal or the, when they typically reach seasonal maximum. Cindy, over to you so, for flooding. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so for Cooney Lake flooding, um, this one has had a substantial amount of attention. We've identified a low-lying areas flooding performance measure that's between 1750 and 1752 feet. And we were able to, we were able to verify that this spring to some degree when there was a high, uh, uh, when the water levels got to 1751.6. And the emergency office um, operations center there uh, indicated there was some worry about in inhabited structures being damaged, but the water went down before uh, that became an issue. So that was encouraging and we'll continue to monitor that as we go forward. Um, so uh, the units again are days per year and we want less is better. And um, so this one we're reasonably, we're reasonably confident with the upper elevation on this one. The second one, the second one is about structure damage and transportation limits. The ferries have been built to particular uh, with the, the, uh, the docking um, of the, the Osprey or, or whatever the Balfour Crawford Bay Ferry is called, um, and the Harrop Ferry, both um, the, the ramps on the Harrop Ferry uh, having particular design limits. Uh, um, and so those uh, become uh, a challenge and, and, uh, and perhaps an, even unusable above 1752 feet. And um, structural damage, structural flooding of, of homes and other um, um, structures happens above 1752 feet as well. So that's how we've set that performance measure. Uh, again, uh, another click please, Lauren, we have submeasures. Oh, that's on the next slide, sorry. Um, um, so could we go back? I, I missed something there. The, the, da the unit that we use for the structure damage is uh, for the structure damage and transportation limits is actually damage in dollars and cents. And that's based on a recent RDCK flood impact study in, in 2020. And we're really fortunate to have that study 
um, the, the RDCK is very fortunate to have that study. And um, it's been really helpful in, in putting this performance measure together. Now, I will flag that the study does not include uh, wave action, uh, wind and wave action. And we are, um, we have had some suggestions about ways to incorporate that into the into the study as well, because that may reduce the the the, uh, uh, the thresholds that we're working with. Uh, we do need photo verification for the uh, 1750 as the initial low lying area flooding elevation. So um, when we start to get high water levels in the spring, we may have some uh, people crawling around taking photos to see when low-lying areas are flooded. And that's going to be kind of difficult because the vegetation line on Kootenai Lake um, has moved about as operations have changed, uh, particularly at Libby. Next slide, please. The, uh, this is the graph uh, from the Kootenai Lake uh, report that shows the damage estimates as the elevation um, uh, uh, goes up. The, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the horizontal line is dollars and the uh, uh, vertical lines are, are elevations. And as the elevation goes up, the, uh, the impacts go up based on this study. Next slide, please. Again, because um, the impacts of flooding aren't just how many days above a certain level, it's how many days for each event and how many years this happens. So we have submeasures for this one. Thank you. So for navigation, as both of us has mentioned, have mentioned previously, the navigation performance measure is um, set by the operational limits of the Balfour Kootenai Bay and Harrop Ferries. So the, the limit for this one is 1738 to 1752, which as we showed is kind of well within normal, normal operating limits of the lake. Um, for recreation and tourism, we recommended a range of 1734.4 uh, to 1748 feet. And that lower level is set by the International Joint Commission order for Kootenai Lake, which it specifies that following freshet, the lake can't, can't go above that level until September. So it would be impossible at this stage to aim for um, anything different. The maximum elevation was set based on our understanding of flood dynamics on the lake, which is that um, the, the lowest lying areas start to flood at around 1749 feet. And though our knowledge of flooding is evolving, as Cindy just mentioned, and so it's, it's possible that we may be able to bump that up by a, a foot or two. These are the submeasures that we've been able to develop for the lake. They mostly come from a, a 2000 report, report for the Kootenai system. So we do have some questions about the data. It's definitely dated and some numbers seem a, a little bit questionable for us, especially that you know, beach, ac beach access is preferable all the way up to 1754, which is when we know there is flooding happening around the lake. So we've acknowledged that some more research um, would be beneficial to help us get a more current understanding of uh, recreational preferences on the lake. Okay, Cooney Lake Crest and Dyke Management um, Performance Measure. Um, this uh, performance measure is based on the results of a, a 2013 technical meeting of floodplain operators that was done as part of the CRT review technical studies. We have had an initial meeting with the Creston Valley Floodplain Management Partnership, and they've indicated to us that the revisions are needed. This was interim because it was based on um, the 2013 studies uh, in the last uh, bit, we've had an initial meeting. We have some more work to do around this one, but I'm going to show you what it is at the moment. And um, you, you can expect some refinements going forward. Next click, please. So there are two performance measures. One is called preferred operating days, and this relates to when the dike and pumping systems work the best. And that's below 1750, which is fortunately below the flooding of low lying areas. Um, so those two line up well. The second performance measure is related to uh, spring dry days. And that this, this performance measure uh, links to allowing movement of farm equipment on properties. And in this case, the level desired level is below 1739.3 uh, feet uh, from um, March to April uh, in, the, in the important seeding season. And again, if you track this process, you can expect to see some changes in this, these performance measures uh, going forward. 
So I think now we can move to questions. And I see um, a number of questions in the chat. Um, there was a question around uh, flooding and uh, people building in the foreshore. Um, and um, that is certainly a risk. And, and with the operations, the Libby Dam operations in particular, but also Duncan uh, regulating the flows uh, into Kootenai Lake, um, the water levels have changed over time and that has allowed for uh, vegetation to be reestablished and that's allowed for what are called accretions to happen and then for people to want to build um, uh, down closer to the lake where there's higher risks. The, the RDCK has um, uh, flood management bylaws and uh, you know does what they can and um, certainly the local governments committee and the recommendations explicitly talks about um, the local governments doing what they can to reduce flood risk. Um, there's a question about a comprehensive map of the lakeshore being flooded, um, illustrating the areas of concern. That is what the Kootenai Lake um, uh, flood risk impact study uh, was based on. And um, the RDCK is the owner of that information. We don't have it as a, as a, as a team. Um, I, I don't have an answer to the question about how many acres were flooded during 2022. Um, I think the next question around monitoring on the lake is an operational question, which is, is outside um, uh, the context of this work. Um, the last question around the weir, I'm not aware of any, question, any uh, um, um, suggestions about building a weir on Kootenai Lake. If this is related to uh, Kukanusa Reservoir, I've already answered that question. And maybe um, Morgan or, or um, uh, uh, Morgan, if you could please put the link in the chat to the, the feasibility study that was done um, for uh, building a weir on, on Kukanusa. Cindy, there's a question in the chat. Somebody's asking if we'll forward all the links that have been posted in the chat as well. And I think we we certainly will forward at least some of them in the email that we send around when we circulate the recording of this session. And we'll compile a list of resources to include in the summary report as well. So you will have record of, of all the links that were thrown up in the chat for you guys here tonight. Uh, I'll also note that we, after the session is done, we'll leave the meeting open a little bit longer for people in case they want to scroll through the chat and just grab some of their links themselves. So there you go. Thanks for the question. Thank you for recognizing there's much work behind this. I want to again thank the socioeconomic team. They have done enormous lifting um, on this work, particularly um, Lauren, um, but also uh, Ryan and, and, and Avery. So uh, thank you for recognizing that. That means a lot. Um, you know, the, the purpose of the work is to, is to create the best set of information that we can um, um, by the local governments committee um, reflecting public uh, values, public interests, so that the information in the scenario modeling is accurate as it possibly can be. And that, that, again, is the, as we described earlier, that is the purpose of this work. Go ahead, Lauren. I had a, a quick sentence there, too, um, about, about, you know, the amount of work. I'll just mention that we didn't start from square one. We were building on uh, past processes that have happened, multiple past processes in some cases, for depending on where you are in the Columbia and, and Kootenai system. And so there's a fair amount of research that we were able to, to draw on, a fair amount of work that was done before us, and, and which allow us to, to access some efficiencies, thankfully. She is a very um, modest woman. <laughs> Thank you for that context, Lauren. I, I would also offer that some of the past public consultation reports that your team looked into uh, included input from some of the folks who are actually on this call right now. So if you've been in involved in past consultation processes to deal with the Columbia River Treaty or water use planning, et cetera, um, good chance your feedback in the, was incorporated into those reports and therefore has informed a lot of the work we're hearing about tonight. There's a series of questions in the chat box, and I'm making sure that there isn't something in there that I am in a position to answer. Um, the, the, the questions are largely around the management of Duncan Dam and its purpose and the impacts, and that is likely, 
it's disappeared out of my off my screen. Um, that, that's beyond the context of this work. Um, sorry, managing my chat box with one hand, trying to. Yeah, no worries, um, Cindy. I might offer, since we do have time for final questions at the end, uh, why don't we take a moment here to move into options for providing feedback. Uh, and then if it'll give you a chance to look at some of the questions in the Q&A box. And then we, we do have a little bit of time at the end here for final questions. Um, so if that's all right with you, maybe I'll turn the floor over to Avery to share how folks can provide their input on the performance measures that you heard about here tonight and the work more broadly um, and, and about the session in general too. So Avery, the floor is yours. Thanks, Brooke. So we've put together a very comprehensive survey that we'd love to encourage everyone to fill out. I'll be posting the link uh, right away in the chat box. You can access that. And that does include a question for each performance measure that we've talked about tonight and also for the Columbia River system as well. So please take some time to fill that out. We do have detailed information on every performance measure on the Columbia River Treaty Local Government uh, Committee website. So we'll be posting that link as well. So make sure if you have any questions or you want more detailed information about all the performance measures we talked about tonight, that you reference that website. Um, the one, the first one posted on the slide here, and we'll also post it momentarily in the box. So that just, yeah, a lot of information that will help you fill out the survey if you do provide more, if you do require more details. Yeah, we really look forward to hearing your feedback. It's really important for us in this process. So thank you so much. Thanks very much, Avery. Uh, and I actually, I just saw a comment come through the chat asking, uh, first of all, saying wonderful leadership in, in both sessions, the Monday session and this session here, and asking if uh, you slash we are all residents of the basin. And I think that's a great question. Uh, if our panelists feel comfortable sharing, um, I'll, I'll start for myself. Uh, the, the most distant of all, I'm, I'm not, I'm a resident of uh, the Victoria or the Lagwangan speaking people's territory. Uh, however, my father grew up in Nelson and has deep roots in the basin. So I do have ties to the area. Cindy, what about yourself? I'm born and raised in this, in the basin. I've worked or lived in pretty much all of it. I currently live in Revelstoke where I can see the cottonwoods along the river outside my window, my office window. And I, I live in Nelson. I've been here for 15 or so years. And Ryan lives in Cranbrook. He unfortunately had to leave us. Um, he lives in Cranbrook and he's done a lot of work in the basin. And I'm also in Nelson. There you go. Uh, and, and just as an aside, I know um, the enormous amount of work being done on uh, efforts outside of the socioeconomic work. So with ecosystems, for example, with salmon, with um, the treaty research in general, so much of it is uh, done by people who are based in the basin. And I mean, goodness, that makes it all the more and more powerful. Um, we're, we're, we get the benefit of firsthand photographs and, and detailed uh, studies by people who can walk out their door and, and see for themselves. So that's great. Uh, we do have a little bit of time for questions, Cindy, if, if there were any that you saw in the Q&A box that you'd like to answer. No? Nope. No, I don't see any that are within my bailiwick. Sounds good. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll reiterate again that... I do have a hand, my hand up. Sorry. I don't see... Oh, sorry, Kathy, oh. I don't see that. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, so... <laughs> I, my role in all of this is the lead for uh, the BC delegation for negotiations and, and working for since 2011 with uh, local government committee and all of you folks in the different communities. And that's why it's so important to have these sessions. It's so important. And, and all of your interests and everything that the LGC, the Local Government Committee is doing is feeding into how we can improve the operations of the treaty to benefit the environmental and the social and economic uh, objectives of, of the basin. So, you know, I, I, I can not say too much about how much it's important for you to contribute to this 
And I really appreciate everyone who has uh, been uh, attending and asking questions and so on. And please continue to do so because that's what is going to really result in something better than we have today. So thank you. Thanks very much for that comment, Kathy. Absolutely. And we'll continue to hold sessions like this uh, as, as long as we can. And it, I would hope, I would hope there's no plans yet, but I would hope we'd be able to come back to the basin soon. We, we the province, outside of this work, the province has been uh, to the basin for multiple rounds of community meetings and um, they're, they're so, so important to be face to face with everybody and, and we're looking forward to doing that again. And I will say that for the local governments committee, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to do this with you. We've, uh, we've waited to get here and we've, I'm glad we've taken our time and got the information together as well as we possibly could. Um, there is a question in the chat that we could answer. Do you want me to tackle it, Brooke? Please do. Yeah, I'm not able to scan through quick enough to okay. see what it is. Go ahead. So, so there's, will there be similar public sessions regarding the ecological performance measures? There was a mm. session in June uh, 2022, and um, that was on, it was on the, it was around uh, three of the performance measures, uh, the ecological performance measures. And um, um, that was on the slide at the beginning, but maybe um, Morgan can pop it in. Uh, the chat now, and I would expect over time that we will return to um, that those the ecological before, rest of the ecological performance will come forward through one of these sessions hosted by the province. Mm -hmm. I'll yeah, certainly be voting for that as a as a citizen of the basin. There you go. And as a side note, the link that will be shared uh, in in the chat to that info session also includes written materials as well that were presented at that session. So uh, you'll get a video like this as well as some written materials too. There it is. Thanks, Morgan. Now, I forgot to say that in the, along the way in the chat, there was a lovely little ha ha from Graham. Thank yes. you for the humor. It's very, very <laughs> helpful, especially at this time of night after a week like this. So it, for those who couldn't see it, it was a comment about a, or about a, a metric for mosquito bites. And uh, Graham it lives in Golden and he says he measures mosquito bites with the metric of bites per minute. <laughs> and yeah, I think many folks in high mosquito areas can relate. Maybe bites per second in some areas. All right. So I, I don't see any other questions. Um, lots of great comments throughout the chat. And I think at this point, we can say thank you so very much to everyone for your time, your thoughtfulness and your questions. Uh, tonight's session, as well as, as previous sessions, um, please do be on the lookout for the email that we will circulate with a link to the recording once it's been posted on YouTube. And uh, that email will also include a link to the survey that we've talked about quite often throughout tonight. And of course, there will be a summary report that will capture what was talked about this evening, as well as uh, responding to the questions that were raised. Uh, and we will include a list of all of the links that we included in the chat too. So you'll have all of that information captured. I think that that is it from me. Uh, oh, I suppose any outstanding questions can also be emailed uh, about this work, can also be emailed to the local government committee's email address, um, info at crtlgc.ca. And any questions about the Columbia River Treaty can be sent to the province's email address at Columbia River Treaty at gov.bc.ca. And uh, you'll, you'll have that on a slide at the very end here. Um, I would like to just conclude with saying I so appreciate Mario Scodelaro, mm. who is, uh, I, I'll get it wrong, I think he's 94, he might be 95, and he's so passionate about his environment, his community, and, and the whole basin, and I just wish that everyone would be the same. So, Mario, hands up. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, there are a lot of really, really engaged folks out there and um, to, to be so engaged for so long, um, it's, it's a real gift. Uh, and for us to hear from, from folks who have such long lived experience, lived history in the basin, it's a real gift. So thank you. And thanks, Kathy, for that comment. 
So I think we can we can call it a night. Uh, thank you, everybody, once again. And like I mentioned, oh, uh, sorry, Linda. <laughs> I was going, lots of lots of hellos and closing comments. Um, before we go, I will pass it over to Linda one more time to to close us out. And once we're we're done here, we'll leave the uh, the meeting open so folks can browse the chat. Linda, thank you very much. Uh, please send us off. I was just saying goodbye to everybody. <laughs> yeah, you pretty well covered it, which is which is great. Uh, if I have one moment, I just would like to extend my sincere appreciation to the socioeconomic integration team, um, uh, Ryan McDonald, Mac Hydro, uh, Lauren Rethere, um from Selkirk Innovates, Avery DeBoer Smith, and to the BC Treaty team. Uh, Brooke, your facilitating was wonderful and as always, and thank you for that. Kathy Eichenberger for being online after a long day. Do appreciate you here. And Morgan for providing the support and uh, keeping the uh, all the contact information flowing into that uh, chat box. Really appreciate you. And to everybody that was here tonight, just thank you for being here, for learning more about the Columbia River Treaty Local Government Committee and all the great works they do. A real special thank you to Cindy Pierce, our executive director, who just holds our heads above the water week after week after week, and even in her condition. <laughs> the one arm bandit, we really appreciate it. And please, folks, mm -hmm. fill out the uh, feedback, please, forms. Um, give us anything that you have on that. As always, uh, your, your input's really valuable to us. And we so appreciate your attending both of, the, of these uh, webinars, at one or both of them, and for all your input. So thanks a lot, folks. Go safe, stay healthy, and thank you. Thanks so much, Linda. I think that's it. So anybody anybody else who's been on the support team here, feel free to turn your cameras on uh, and we'll we'll wave goodbye, good night, and we'll see you soon.